All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Carlton Poindexter, and I'm a doctoral student at the University of Maryland in the Department of Environmental Science and Technology. And my advisor is Dr. Stephanie Lansing. And all right, welcome to my presentation. I'll be talking about my presentation in the scoop on poop tech, antibiotics, and manure management, where we'll be going over different management strategies for mitigating antibiotics. Uh, this is a general presentation overview where we talk about antibiotic usage in agriculture, antibiotics in the environment. Then we'll get into the manure treatment as well as general manure variability and how that affects manure treatment. And then we'll talk a little bit about my current research and then finally on the conclusion. So as we're all familiar with recent antibiotic, antibiotic regulation and laws, specifically the veterinary feed directive, which is basically making the use of antibiotics more stringent and making it more specific to making sure that the animals actually stick when we are administering antibiotics and just monitoring overall usage. And recently, Maryland, as well as California, have passed, so California passed a state bill, 27, or the Senate Bill 27, and Maryland has a Keeping Antibiotic Effective Act that are similar, that are only reinforcing the veterinary feed directive while uh, making um, antibiotic use more specific, or not specific, but tailoring, tailoring the usage and making sure that veterinarians are actually signing off and that the animals actually require treatment. All right, so the next couple graphs have actually been taken from the FDA summary of antibiotics uh, distribution. And so this first graph is showing uh, from the year of 2019 to 2017, uh, antibiotic consumption based on weight in total kilograms. And so this, the graph is broken into medically important and non-medically important. Medically important re referencing antibiotics that are both used in animal agriculture as well as for human consumption and human treatment of infections and disease. And there's been a, a particular focus on a lot of these, uh, particularly these four with macrolides, penicillin, sulfamides, and tetracycline. Specifically, they've been of high uh, relevance in a lot of the research, both clinically and within agricultural studies. Now, as you can see with all of these, all of the antibiotics, there's been a dramatic decrease from the year of 2016 to 2017 that is for the most part directly, result, directly related to the veterinary feed directive. And for uh, tetracyclines, there looks to be about a 43% decrease from 2016 sales to 2017. Now this next graph kind of reinforces the first one in that it breaks, it, it breaks the antibiotic usage down into the types of animals and the animal industries that are using the most antibiotics. So cattle and swine and turkey are, are the top three, at least with the ones that they've recorded, with cattle being the highest. And then there's, again, a dramatic shift between 2016 and 2017. Now this next slide breaks it down even further. So this is having the different classes of antibiotics and then just the use, utilization within each animal at industry with cattle using the most for tetracycline, well cattle being using the most antibiotics throughout all of the, most of the antibiotics, specifically the macrolides, penicillins, and sulfamides. But then swine being second for tetracycline, but for penicillins, it seems that turkeys, or penicillins are primarily given to turkeys as well. So it just gives a different uh, distribution and background of the different areas of animal agriculture that are using these antibiotics. So now this schematic was taken from this uh, CDC pamphlet uh, off their website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you guys let me know if anything going on, I just had something say that the internet was unstable, but I'll continue until further notice. So, um, on the orange, this is kind of a big picture of how antibiotics are being produced and how they're enter entering the environment via human consumption or animal consumption or uses as on crops for fertilizers. So what we're specifically focused on is, 
is our area where it's within animal utilization. And as we know, uh, studies have shown that even as we're administered, both anim as animals and humans are both administered antibiotics, somewhere between as low as 17% to 90% of those antibiotics come out in our waste, either in their parent compound form or still biologically active metabolites. So for animal agriculture specifically, when we, uh, we usually treat manure and we want to treat manure and we end up putting it back onto cropland for as a fertilizer. So in that regard, you're kind of moving antibiotics around as it's coming out of the cows so and cows and chickens and uh, pigs. And we're putting that back onto the field. And then from human consumption side, it's coming out in our waste that goes to wastewater treatment plants. And then those get exposed to just the natural environment as that wastewater is being treated and put it and input it into streams, into natural streams. So we've kind of been talking about antibiotic resistance and we talk about AMR, so what exactly is antibiotic resistance? So when we take antibiotics, when anti antibiotics are getting exposed to bacteria, it generates a selective pressure on the microbial community, which results in usually some type of inhibition or death of the bacteria, but some bacteria are uh, naturally resistant and that resistant bacteria then starts to proliferate and fill that void that has been created after the bacteria after the antibiotics have killed off the other bacteria and then bacteria also have that ability to transfer some of those drug resistant genes to other bacteria and then that's how antibiotic resistance builds these various mechanisms mechanisms of gene transfer all right so now we're talking about manure treatment technology so I want to say, well, let's put it out here. Most manure treatment is generally set for a specific need or treatment goal of the farm, usually in reduction of nutrients such as like nitrogen or phosphorus, odor reduction, volume reduction, or energy recovery in the case of anaerobic digestion. We're just trying to add some type of value to the manure along with using it as a fertilizer. But it should be noted, and as a lot of us know that these manure management practices and these manure treatments aren't necessarily tailored towards reducing antibiotics within the back, within the manure, but some of them do pose to have benefits, in, which is what I'll go into today. So in today's talk, I'm gonna specifically focus on composting, lagoons, and anaerobic digestion, as these are common practices for manure management throughout the United States and throughout the world. And these three different management procedures seem to have different, uh, seem to be effective at reducing antibiotic resistant genes, antibiotic resistant bacteria, and as well as antibiotics, specifically focused on the antibiotics for today's talk. So right now this is a diagram of the composting process and within the compost uh, there's the antibiotics, that's specific, uh, tetracycline molecule. So, and as you know, the composting process just has microbes breaking down the material uh, and so like a humus rich substance that can then again be reapplied for on the reapplied to agricultural fields. But in that process of composting, there are various mechanisms that can help break down antibiotics and two of them being the microorganisms in them of themselves, which are either metabolizing the antibiotics or they're either metabolizing, yeah, which are metabolizing antibiotics or just interacting with them that, or that will pull them out or find a way to inactivate them. Or there's also the change in carbon and nitrogen sources, which also change the, the kind of structure or the properties of the organic material. Other factors that play, in the part, play a part in antibiotic degradation are, or such as heat, because as the microbes are metabolizing and breaking down all this material, breaking down the carbon, breaking down the nitrogen, um, they're also generating a lot of heat. So as we know within the piles, within composting piles, it's really hot. So that heat in itself can lead to antibiotic degradation and just overall time, the, the exposure time. And the, as for some antibiotics, the longer they, let, they stay in the piles, the longer they stay exposed, they start to degrade over time, but there's variability in how long the different classes and the different types of antibiotics can stay stable in the environment. Mm -hmm. Another method is the, are the lagoons. So lagoons, I'm specifically focused on open lagoons. There are closed lagoons, but for this 
This is an example we have open where we have a beta lactam molecule that's in the water that treats so lagoons obviously are treating more aqueous solutions and there's the idea that uh, some classes of antibiotics like the like these more aqueous sub substrates. So now move over, move over, move more towards that. So let's we'll see how lagoons treat those. And so photolysis, as they're being exposed outside in the sun, the UV rays can lead to degradation. Again, just the microorganisms uh, metabolizing the antibiotics. And then with the sludge and the aqueous, they're kind of separating over time. There is absorption where the antibiotic molecules end up uh, chelating or binding to different organic material and other solid material that end up settling in the sludge at the bottom. Now, in terms of anaerobic digestion, we all will we mostly know, and for anybody doesn't know, that it's just a series of biological processes of microorganisms breaking down bio biodegradable material under anaerobic condition. And typically, anaerobic digesters produce uh, digestate, which that can be reused as a fertilizer, which is a nutrient-rich source. Or, and it also generates methane that can be trapped and used as heat and used as a renewable energy source. But in the process of anaerobic digester, they're generally held at mesophilic temperatures, which is around 35 degrees Celsius. Or at thermophilic, or thermophilic digesters are held at 55, so there, there's already that temperature, that increased temperature that can help break down uh, antibiotics as well as just the micro, microbial processes. And then anaerobic digestion can be referenced in four phases of hydrolysis, acetogenesis, and then acetogenesis, and followed by methanogenesis. And then those different processes, different compounds are being made, which can change the pH and can change the conditions that end up influencing antibiotic degradation. And then just overall, being biodegraded by the microbes in the mode itself. So what I have created today was based off uh, a review on anaerobic digestion and composting efficiencies of antibiotic degradation. And it was taken from Yonquist et al. in 2016. And this is just, and I've kind of used their, they had a review and a table that had all the uh, removal efficiencies and I kind of used other papers and other research to fill out the rest and then give ideas and before I move on further for the lagoons a couple of those were not filled in and that's not because they don't have any effect on those antibiotics but I just wasn't able to find studies to have measured those and to measure uh, the degradation efficiencies or removal efficiencies of just the lagoon and having it being out in just manure storage but you can see for a lot of them, there's a wide range of efficiency from anywhere between 30 to 80 percent and 40 to 90 percent, or even for the quinolone for anaerobic digestion, 9 to 74 percent. So there's a lot of variability in how the antibiotics are being degraded and how effective these manure management practices are at actually degrading antibiotics, which leads us to manure variability. So that wide range or that wide scope of uh, removal efficiencies are due to the manure type. So the cattle manure versus swine manure, they have different properties. There's moisture content. There's, uh, there's obviously the general pH and there's different variables that play in the factor as well as their diet. They also have so many variabilities in how the manure will come out as well as the concentration of antibiotics actually coming out. <laughs> Which then leads us to the, as we are trying to monitor antibiotic concentrations, we need to develop standardized and, reproduci and reproducible, me reproducible methods for quantifying these manures. Currently, that's one of our limitations is this analysis because our analysis can only go so far in terms of how well they can detect concentrations. And because typically antibiotics are analyzed with uh, liquid chromatography in tandem with mass spec. And so there's uh, extraction efficiencies that we lose antibiotics and there's just overall, are we searching, can we detect the antibiotics and are we detecting the appropriate antibiotics that are still biologically active that can influence antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic resistance specifically. Those are the kind of limitations that we're currently having in dealing with nerve, uh, in dealing with trying to quantify antibiotics and seeing if these treatments are actually effective. 
for antibiotics and manure. So again, we're not sure exactly how much of the antibiotic residues are in manure when they're applied to agricultural land, either being unprocessed or with processing. And that again ties back to our quantification uh, methods and how as technology progresses, then we can have better analysis and that can go down to lower concentrations. And just with more knowledge, we can figure out which, how the antibiotics are being metabolized and what of which one of these metabolites we should look at for future reference that can influence antibiotic resistance. Also, the bioavailability of antibiotic residues from land applied manure depends on the physiochemical interactions of the antibiotic classes. The beta-lactams have a different structure than tetracycline, so how they interact with other particles and material in the manure and in the soils are different. So tetracyclines tend to chelate to metals within the metals and other organic material within manure, while others are more hydrophilic, so they like to stay in the more aqueous portions and liquid portions. So all these need to come into consideration as we're talking about antibiotics and measuring them and seeing how effective our methods are. Which brings me to my current research that I'm conducting at the University of Maryland with Dr. Lansing under a USDA ANIFA grant where we want to create a protocol for manure assessment and then assessing the effects of temperature on reducing AMR and manure treatment technologies. So we're right now we're working on, we have two objectives and the first is defining AMR variability and creating sampling protocols for researchers as well as quantifying the effects of temperature on antibiotics, ARG, and ARBs in manure. So with this first uh, objective of variability and being able to quantify, I've been working with US, at the USDA Beltsville Agricultural Research Center where we've been developing a LCMS method for detecting a broad spectrum of antibiotics, whereas typically most, most researchers and most studies are focused either on one class or one or two classes. We have around, we have a class within four classes. We have beta-lactams, we have sulfamides, macrolides, and tetracyclines. And we've actually gotten good recovery for beta-lactams because they're, they're a funny group to work with because they uh, hydrolyze so quickly. So as we can remember, if you look back onto my graph of the removal efficiencies, beta-lactams had 100% removal because they hydrolyze very quickly in the environment. But that doesn't mean that they're not having any type of selective pressure. And where I am currently, or what we're working on now, is assessing the effects of temperature-based manure treatment technology or just antibiotic resistance, where we're doing a comparative study between with a rotary drum, a thermophilic digestion, and a thermohydrolysis pre-treatment and seeing how these different technologies and these different treatments will ultimately reduce antibiotics, ARGs, and ARBs. So in conclusion, the big takeaways I would like for people to take from, hopefully from my presentation, is that traditional manure technologies are not designed for antibiotic removal, although they do, they are showing promise in various forms of the different ways that they can remove antibiotics. There are currently limitations to antibiotic detection methods, and that can, and as technology progresses, and as we learn more, and we know what uh, which antibiotics to look for, which metabolites to look for, that'll all help in better tailoring our methods and making our methods more robust. And then at the end of the day, as we're removing antibiotics, there is is that these low concentrations, these subinhibitory concentrations, that antibiotic residuals are the likely drivers of antibiotic resistance as when they're at high concentrations, they can wipe out, they can be very detrimental to a bacterial population, but when they're at these lower levels, that's when the bacteria can start to become resistant because it's not that high and those resistant bacteria can potentially start to transfer some of those genes. 